Well, a warm uh, welcome to you all on this cool fall uh, morning. Uh, we welcome you to Vicent's Chapel. We are continuing in our series on the life of David and the, in the books of Samuel. Um, it, it gives me a lot of joy to introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Will Kynes. Um, Will is, is no stranger uh, to Beeson. He's become a dear friend of our institution over the, over the years. Uh, he came to Sanford in 2019 um, from Whitworth University. Um, he has multiple degrees, which you can read about on the back of your uh, worship guide. Um, his most recent book that I wanted to draw attention to is entitled Wrestling with Job, Defiant Faith in the Face of Suffering that he wrote with his father, a Bill Kynes, who I just learned is here today, I believe. Um, welcome to the Kynes family. We're glad to have you. Um, so uh, uh, Will has been a real gift to Beeson. Uh, you see him investing himself in students regularly. He loves the subject matter that he teaches, and you can sense that when you're with him. Um, and most importantly, Will is married to Vanessa, and he has three uh, beautiful little girls. So we are very excited to have Will with us today and look forward uh, to hearing him bring uh, the word. It's one of the highlights of my week each week to walk across the quad from my office in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies over in Chapman Hall to join you in worship at Beeson's Chapel. So it is a great privilege for me to be able to contribute to the worship here that has so enriched my own soul. Let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. David wept. Saul, the king of Israel, was dead. David's beloved friend Jonathan had fallen with him. And when David heard the news, 2 Samuel 1, 11 and 12 tells us, he and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. We hear of David weeping twice before this chapter, before he and his dear friend Jonathan part as David flees from Saul's jealous rage. We read in 1 Samuel 20, then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Then in 1 Samuel 30, when David and his men returned to their fortress in Ziklag to find it burned to the ground and all their wives and children abducted by the Amalekites, David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. But David will weep many more times after this chapter when his general Abner is killed, when his infant child with Bathsheba dies, when his son Absalom murders his son Amnon, when he flees Jerusalem during Absalom's rebellion, when Absalom is killed in battle. David is a king who weeps. His tears become a torrent of laments in the Psalter. To take one example, Psalm 6, Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Here in 2 Samuel 1, David weeps because his nation has lost a battle and its king, and he has lost a friend. And they're not coming back. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen, verse 19. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights, verse 25. The finality of death drives his lament. The past tense here murders hope with blow after crushing blow. The shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. They were loved and admired. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Your love for me was wonderful. 
And in hope's place, frustration and anger. David is enraged by the thought of his enemies gloating over their conquest. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. In his despair, David turns on creation itself. Mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, may no showers fall on your terraced fields, for there the shield of the mighty was despised. Theology is surprisingly absent from this text. David's lament for Saul and Jonathan never mentions or even alludes to God. David addresses Philistine cities, mountains, the daughters of Israel, even his deceased friend Jonathan, but never God. And there's a profound truth here. In suffering, God often feels devastatingly absent. We see it in psalm after psalm. Psalm 13, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Job, I know some of you are wondering how long it would take for me to get to Job. In Job, after railing at God for chapter after chapter and hearing no response, Job says in chapter 23, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. If I go forward, he is not there. Or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. In a grief observed, C.S. Lewis's strikingly honest reflection on his experience of mourning the death of his wife after a mere four years of marriage, Lewis writes, Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you're happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you were tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? a door slammed in your face, and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. God's absence in David's lament, then, is profound and appropriate. It's a reflection of the honesty and insight with which Scripture, and the Old Testament especially, presents the raw reality of human suffering. We naturally ask, where is God when I need him most? David's lament reflects that sense of divine abandonment. Have you felt that before? You can be sure that among the people you minister, you will encounter some who are stumbling through this kind of dark night of the soul. And yet, despite God's absence, even this funeral elegy exudes theological truth. Every tear shed, every tear ever shed in this fallen world makes a theological declaration with more authority than any ecclesiastical synod. Every tear declares this world is not as it should be. Even still, each tear that streams before the Lord, all weeping in faith, also proclaims, I know you, Lord, can make this right. And we know David hasn't given up on God, because in chapter 2, we again see him acting in faith, inquiring of the Lord. So as David's laments demonstrate, he is confident in God's eventual justice. The army of Israel may have fallen, but the story of God's people is not over. David has not lost his faith in his God. But the faith that God will one day make things right does not negate the tears. They can and must be shed. This lament must be taught to the people of God. It must be written down in the book of Jashar for future generations. The the spirituals sung by enslaved people who endured unimaginable pain and degradation here in the South 
they powerfully declare this theological truth as they bring their suffering to the Lord, pleading through their streaming tears for him to intervene. I'm in trouble, Lord. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble, Lord, trouble about my grave. Sometimes I weep, sometimes I mourn. I'm in trouble about my grave. Sometimes I can't do neither one. I'm in trouble about my grave. In the spiritual, some valiant soldier, they sang, I want some valiant soldier to help me bear the cross, for I weep, I weep, I can't hold out. If any mercy, Lord, oh pity, poor me. And this echoes Lamentations 1.16, which says in the King James Version, which some enslaved people may have known, for these things I weep, Mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. By lamenting here, I can't hold out and questioning if God has any mercy. These spirituals are not expressing doubt. What they're trying to do is prompt the Lord to provide comfort soon. These tears well over from a deep reservoir of faith. Faith expressed not in spite of, but through weeping. These tears express a defiant faith that recognizes the brokenness of this world, but also believes God is good enough and powerful enough to make it right, and so expresses that pain to God. These tears draw on an extensive tradition of defiant faith, which extends across Scripture. This semester, I'm really enjoying reading several examples of this tradition with Beeson students here in Hebrew 3. I see some of you uh, out there. We're reading about Abraham who asks, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just when God contemplates wiping out Sodom? About Jacob wrestling with God and refusing to let go until he gets his blessing from God. Moses arguing God out of destroying Israel after the golden calf. And then again after they refuse the, to enter the promised land. But there's also Job, the psalmists, the prophets. Though contemporary Christians often struggle with defiant faith, thinking instead that pious submission is the only appropriate response to suffering in this life, this widespread biblical tradition indicates that weeping and even arguing with God can also be a faithful response to this broken world. And we know this because David is not the only king who weeps. Jesus also had a friend he loved. But when he was told in John 11 that Lazarus was sick, he didn't rush to be with him or to heal him. Instead, he declared, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Then he waited two days, and death did come. When Jesus finally arrived, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. His body had begun to decompose. As the King James Version bluntly put it, he stinketh. But Jesus' assurance is undaunted. He says to Lazarus' sister Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? We're not completely sure if Martha does believe this, though she says that she does. But we have no doubts that Jesus believes it. And yet, when he saw Lazarus' friend and family, friends and family weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then, as he approached the grave, we are told, Jesus wept. I've loved this verse as long as I can remember, but not always for the same reason. When I was a kid, I loved it because there was a man in my church, Ralph Carlton, who used to give us candy if we could recite a Bible verse. And this verse was one word less than trick-or-treat, and I didn't have to wait a whole nother year to use it to get candy. But then, when I was in college, Planes 
crashed into buildings. One just 10 miles away from my house outside of D.C. Dust and ash and smoke and screams filled the air. And the world changed. Jesus wept no longer meant an easy sugar rush. Whenever one around me was weeping, when I was struggling to reconcile my beliefs about God with the chaos of this sin-soaked and suffering-saturated world, Jesus wept meant so much more. It meant I didn't have to choose between believing in a powerful, just, and loving God and entering into the pain of this world. Jesus knew that Lazarus would rise from the dead, but he still wept when he experienced firsthand the searing pain of loss. There's an important lesson here for seminarians and their professors. Don't let what we know, what we believe, what we think we understand, prevent us from entering into the pain of those in our care. The divisions between systematic theology or biblical theology or even historical theology on the one hand and pastoral theology on the other are artificial and ultimately unhelpful. If your theology doesn't lead you to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, it's not Christian theology. It doesn't follow the example of Christ. We worship a king who weeps. Now, if you have trouble weeping with those who weep, one of the gifts of biblical lament is its ability to train the hearts of those who have been spared of suffering so that they can enter into the suffering of others. So read the laments with the afflicted in mind, and you'll begin to feel the pain that they describe. Laments are the spray thrown up by the whitewater rapids of the river of suffering and brokenness that flows from the sin in the garden. When we pray the laments, we step into that river. We flinch as the biting cold splashes on our souls. We're pulled into the chaos in the lack of control. And that will motivate you to prayer and to action. But some of us don't have the privilege of standing on the banks and choosing whether or not we want to ride those rapids. Some of us have been pulled under by the irresistible current of suffering. You don't need laments to pull you further down. You need something to hold on to, an oar, a log, a life vest, just anything to keep your head above the waves. And here's the amazing thing about the biblical laments. They can do that too by reaching into and reflecting our suffering, by putting our pain into words, and by drawing us into a broader community of sorrow, they provide a means for us to move through our suffering and maintain our faith. Now, C.S. Lewis's wife was not the only woman he dearly loved and lost too soon. His mother died when he was young, and in The Magician's Nephew, Lewis has a young boy named Diggory wrestle with his own mother's rapidly approaching death. Diggory meets Aslan in a freshly created Narnia, and Lewis writes, he looked to Aslan, the great lion, but please, please, won't you, can't you give me something that will cure mother? Diggory asks. Up till then, he had been looking at the lion's great feet and the huge claws on them. Now, in his despair, he looked up at its face. When he, what he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. For the tawny face was bent down near his own, and, wonder of wonders, great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know grief is great. We worship a king who weeps. He knows that grief is great. Sometimes in our suffering and loss, we're fixated on the lion's great feet and huge claws, but look up into his face and you will see tears. Like David, 
His friend's death is not the last time Jesus will weep. He will weep over Jerusalem, God's beloved city, doomed to destruction because it failed to recognize the Messiah. And like David, Jesus will lament. As Jesus quotes the laments throughout his ministry, as he physically embodies their words in his own suffering, God himself joins us in our suffering. As Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted, tried, tested in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. We often speak of Jesus as the perfect priest, the perfect prophet, the perfect king, fulfilling these roles from the Old Testament, but he is also the perfect sufferer, the perfect lamenter. On the cross, he will cry out with the words of one of David's laments, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And like Saul and Jonathan, he will die. That roiling river of suffering that, throws, that flows through the biblical laments and across history, which drenches us all at some point in our lives, Jesus dives into it, and it swallows him completely. And we could imagine his disciples on that dark Saturday, tearing their robes and weeping like David and his men, when the one that they had hoped was going to redeem Israel was lying in the grave. We can hear them lamenting how the mighty has fallen. But Jesus, he's a king who weeps, but he is also a king who triumphs. They should have known that that wasn't the end of the story. Like like David, Jesus wept when his friend died, but then, unlike David, Jesus strode confidently to the tomb, had the stone rolled away from its entrance, and called Lazarus out from the grave. And like so many of David's laments, the one that Jesus quoted on the cross, it does not end in tears. Psalm 22 declares the Lord's salvation, which spreads from the descendants of Israel across space to the ends of the earth and across time to future generations, concluding they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. David's Psalter ends with all of creation joining in worship, opposed to that devastation of creation that David longs for in the lament that we just read for Jonathan. Job's story ends with Job restored and everything made right. Lewis has Aslan give Diggory a fruit that will heal his mother. This isn't just wish fulfillment. This is the biblical pattern of reality. Knowing this, even in the midst of their pain, enslaved people would sing, I've got a robe. You've got a robe. All of God's children got a robe. When I get to heaven, going to put on my robe, going to shout all over God's heaven. We live in a world that weeps. We worship a king who weeps, but we worship him because he is also a king who triumphs. In his tear-stained and blood-spattered death, Jesus triumphed over death itself. He vanquished sin and all the suffering and loss that it brings with it. When Jesus was swallowed up in that rushing river of suffering, God swallowed up suffering in himself. This is what Isaiah promised in Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. We can and should weep now. But there will come a day, now you're seminarians, you know where I'm going at this point, but the well-worn ruts in Scripture are well-worn for a reason. They follow the natural contours of God's Word and God's world like a river picking a trail through uneven terrain. So let's follow them where they lead with confident hope. We can and should weep now. But there will come a day when in the words of Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Lewis ends a grief observed with a line from Dante. Poesi torno all'eterna fontana. Then she turned back to the eternal fountain. 
These words from one of the final cantos of the Paradiso describe Beatrice, who has led the poet to heaven, but she's now turning finally and forever from the poet toward the glory of God. So despite the desolating loss of his wife, Lewis here expresses his enduring faith that she is now enraptured by the beauty of God. Now, David doesn't express such hope here, but neither did Lewis until the last couple pages of his book. Our mourning cannot be rushed, but it will end. Live, minister, and preach in such a way that the tears are real, but their end is realer. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, this morning we weep with those who weep. We entrust to your loving care those who are struggling with pain and loss. We look forward in faithful anticipation to the time when you will heal this broken world. As Psalm 30 says, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Rise, O Son of God, and dispel the darkness. In Jesus' triumphant name we pray, amen.